all, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for putting this together. I was just mentioning to someone backstage, like, there's a high vibration in here. It's really beautiful. So, um, hello. <laughs> um, I'd like to take a moment to figure out how this works. <laughs> I'd like to take a moment of silence, please. Because all of our heroes are gone. Well, that's obviously not true. Angela, right? Mark Brand. There's heroes all around us. There's heroes in your community. And I'm willing to bet that there's a hero in your own family. I'm even willing to go one step further and guarantee that there's a hero in every single one of you here, right? Some of us are tapping into that superness, and some of us are still waiting to figure out what comes. My name is Yaro, named after a flower. I'm not from Scandinavia. It was a hippie name. I hated it when I was a kid. It's grown on me, so to speak. And one of my original heroes was my mother, who, uh, when I was two years old, left her husband, my father, uh, from a, an abusive relationship, 25 cents in her pocket, said she was going to the store, and didn't look back. Worked several jobs to get herself a car, drive to Minneapolis, put herself through undergrad, got her family's first college degree, and went to Montana to go to grad school. She was a real hero for me. Every house that we lived in for about three and a half years there while she worked several jobs would get condemned and bulldozed. It's like government subsidized housing. They're like, we're done with that. We're going to build something nicer. So we watched all these homes kind of get destructed in front of us. And I remember as a kid, I was like, wow, that's really cool. It was fascinating, you know? And seeing all these homes, like one time a big crane came through and knocked the first half of the house off, and there was a guy on the third floor that sat up in bed. And I was like, oh, there's Mike. Um, one day this guy next door comes over and takes a picture of my mom and I, that photograph right there. And I remember just thinking, I wonder how that thing works. That's really interesting. I asked my mom a bunch of questions about the camera and later she saved up enough money working her three or four jobs and got me a camera and it became a perspective shifter. It was kind of my first entrance into the world of empathy. And I started carrying that camera with me everywhere. And I would document the, the trips to school and. And eventually, my mom graduated, and her first teaching job out of grad school was at a Native American reservation. And just when I thought we were like moving up in the world, we got to this place, and it was pretty grim. And I couldn't wait to get the last box off the, the truck and run down and play with the other kids in the, in, the, in the schoolyard. And I got down there, and I'm like, yo! And the basketball stops bouncing, and this guy walks up to me, looks me up and down, and like, bam! Just pops me right in the face, my nose is bleeding, I was just like, what I say? And as it turns out, I was the only white kid in that whole school. I was there for two and a half years. And they called me Little Custard. And they chased me. <laughs> they chased me every single day. I was like the entertainment. And if I could get home, sneaking out of class every single day, wait for the bell to ring, it was like a full game. And for about you know, two years. And uh, if I could get home before they caught me, you know, I was safe. But, Usually, they caught me, and they would hold me down and just beat me, kick me, until I would start crying, and then they'd run off. So I ended up graduating, or uh, leaving that school, and going to high school and about a year and a half later. And I moved there, I was playing cello. By the way, I was the first seat cellist in fifth grade, Philip. <laughs> and I moved there playing cello, and I left like doing push-ups and lifting weights, and I'm like, Arr! I had a chip on my shoulder by the time I got out of the reservation. I was pissed. And one day, about you know, a year and a half later, I was uh, halfway through my freshman year of high school and I was wrestling and, and I was just starting to get kind of like more physical. And, and I came around the corner in this basketball tournament and saw these guys from the res that used to beat me up. And they'd all like stayed the same size. And I was like, and I was like, ho oh. <laughs> ho. And it was such an interesting moment. I'll just never forget this moment. It was just like this rapid flash card of why they were so angry and why they were so upset. And 
It was, an, it was a moment of putting myself in someone else's shoes. And I thought to myself, like, it's such a cycle of hatred. And that I was not going to be a part of that. In fact, I've been an underdog my whole life, and I'm rooting for the underdog. Like, I, I looked around, and I saw these guys, and I'm like, hey, guys. And then I just kept moving. And from that point forward, I just I realized that, you know, the underdogs are counted out and that it's up to us to really identify and look around and find those underdogs and root for them and, and elevate them. So that life lesson for me, you know, I had an interesting conversation with Cortland the other day. I was like, yeah, I, I mean, kind of felt a little bit lucky to have been a white guy that felt racism. That's not lucky. It's not, I mean, and it didn't follow me through the rest of my life, right? Like, that was an isolated incident, but it, that, it, it set a perspective. And so moving forward, I had a dream to be a filmmaker. I ended up, you know, that camera I fell in love with, I ended up putting that into a, a profession. And I started making commercials and music videos and set my sights on Hollywood and I was gonna be a big time director and there was no question in my mind that that's exactly what I was going to do because pretty much when I put my mind to something, that's what's gonna happen. And sure enough, <laughs> I was on big movie sets, carrying coffee, taking out the trash. But I had another perspective shift. I just say to myself, don't just be a PA, which is a production assistant, which is a guy that does this. And I was like, be the best there ever was. And so as I'm running around getting coffee and trash and everything else, I'm like, I had a camera with me. And I was taking photographs of people on the set. At the end of the day, I'd go process those photographs and hand them out. People are like, well, thanks. A lot of those guys end up being on my first film crew. And the guys I was working with, Michael Bay, Big, huge movies. Uh, one of the films I was on with him, Alan Davio was the cinematographer. He did E.T. He did Closing Cards of the Third Kind. Alan Davio was Oscar-winning cinematographer for Steven Spielberg. I was just like, oh, I don't know. And I'd follow those guys around, and like, when I wasn't like, doing my job, I'd like, follow, and one day I was like, looking over their shoulders on this top of this huge skyscraper in Los Angeles, and I was watching this shot come together, and it was like a jet and a Ferrari and I'm like, oh, all this like stuff. The, the choreography of it all, all these things, like cue this, which is like 45 miles away. Cue this, which is like 10 miles away. Cue, cue, do, boop, 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 boop. And in this two and a half second window, I was like, holy crap. And Michael turns around, I was like, what? I'm like, oh, uh, not invisible. That was amazing. He's like, you're fired. <laughs> and I was like, well, why? I'm like the best PA you have. He's like, yeah, I, I heard you have a director's reel. You should go do that. So I did. I got signed to an agent. Uh, my first job as any you know, white kid from Montana, uh, rap videos. <laughs> and it was a big job. It happened to be for the Batman movie that year. It was a really big job. These guys, Bone Thugs and Harmony, just came off their Grammys. And, and I was up on top of the skyscraper in a bat plane. And it's really cool. Um, and I ended up doing some, you know, a lot of really interesting jobs with The Rock and Branson and P. Diddy. Like the, the industry itself has led me to meet some really interesting people. But I was at this Hollywood Hills party one night looking around and Everyone was just so pretty and handsome, and they looked like just so well put together. And, and I was like looking around, I was like, wow. I was moving here to the epicenter of creative geniuses to be inspired every single day. And I walked outside and I like leaned against this handrail and overlooking the city, I was like, where are they? And this guy next to me says, who? I'm like, whoa, where'd you come from? <laughs> <laughs> There's like no one out here. And so I started talking to this guy. I'm like, oh, what's your story? He's like, well, I'm a composer. I'm from Czechoslovakia, I teach deaf kids how to read and play music. And I was like, wow, how does that work? That's, what are the physics of is the reward for the vibration? Like, and they, wow, that's amazing. And I went to sleep that night thinking about that. I was just like, just pondering. I was like, wow, you just like ask the universe and like, there it is. <laughs> and, and the very next day I was waiting in line for coffee and there was this guy, a scientist from Helsinki piecing the ozone layer back together. And again, I'm just like stopped in my tracks. I'm like, is that working? <laughs> You're like saving the world. You're like a real life superhero. You're like, well, you know, if we're successful, we're gonna avoid 100 million diseases in the next 20 years. I'm like, dude, that's incredible. Every night for the next two weeks, I would just meet these incredible people, right? And sometimes it was the person bagging my groceries. It was like small talk would lead to, oh yeah, after this I go donate my time to a local soup kitchen and it just, I just like, every day. So I woke up one morning, these points of light that you just saw with this 
lightning bolt of an idea. This was 1999, pre-Facebook, pre-MySpace, and I thought to myself, there's no way to find these ins inspirational stories. Like, if they only knew about each other, if they could just like look across this mountain and see you're rolling this boulder up the mountain, it's like really, really hard to do the improbable, the impossible. If they only knew that each other existed, there'd be this support network of inspirational people that you could then reflect back to this next generation as alternatives to only athletes and entertainers, but educators and scientists and people in your own backyard, real life superheroes. So it was a gamble. I called my production company that I was signed to. I was like, hey, I'm going to take a little leave of absence. And they're like, a leave of what? You're fired. I'm like, well, I guess I'm not that big of a deal yet. And so I started this company. It was dot com era, right? Um, but we really just started with just the idea of making trading cards for real life heroes to create this community, this network with one premise. There's extraordinary people everywhere and to find one look within. And that was really the goal. It was like to build these trading cards to unleash this hero within through a series of questions and asking yourself, like, what is your real life superpower? And once you tap into that real life superpower, there's a whole transformation of things that could happen. And these are some examples, right? You know, we did a whole stay in school program with uh, Shaquille O'Neal. I mean, it's pretty good street cred when you walk into a school and Shaq's next to you. And kids are like, oh, paying attention. And that's my nemesis in the middle because we all play our hero and our nemesis every single day. Only you can defeat you. So in this case, Buddy Bland is a master of chaos and distraction. He's like, who's your buddy? He's like a, kind of a mixture between Don King and Geraldo. And, <laughs> and my, my real hero was Synapse Dream, power of the dream, able to manifest dreams into reality, not just for myself, but for others. And, and, but he had ADD, so he was easily distracted. And if he couldn't stay focused, then like, there was no way he could manifest his dreams. So, it was, it was this kind of interesting like psychological dichotomy and we started doing this with these kids and what was really cool is watching them manifest these powers within themselves. Like you ask these questions and they would like literally start to stand up straighter. Be your own superhero was the mantra. And so as, you know, 1999, 2000, 2001, dogfood.com is getting sold for $50 million or whatever. I'm like, we got real content. Every time I wake up, there is a... 1,500 new stories waiting for me. You know, we walk into Warner Brothers, we're pitching them, and there's like, how much you pay for your writers? Well, that's proprietary. Like, well, we don't pay for anything. They just show up every single day. Self-aggregated content. We grew it to a million and a half people from my garage, before Facebook and MySpace. This, this little graph here is how the, the game worked. So your card, once you created it, would go onto this digital trading platform called the Karma Counter, and you'd rise up this Karma Counter by gathering these points those little blue crystals called knowledge nuggets. So it was like the early days of cryptocurrency. And the more knowledge you'd feed your character, the higher you'd rise through these platforms, these different tiers of sponsor-driven prizes. And at the end, it was like this you know, opportunity to be famous and get released in real life trading card decks in your stores and you know, comic book stores near you. So kids would go run there and rip it open and look at it. But what was really cool was once we knew that we had them hooked with the games that they played to gather these points, they would get this prompt. This is, how do you save the world? Start with where you are. You type in your zip code and you're given 15 things you can do within a five mile radius of where you live to make the world a better place. It would tap into a volunteer match engine. It would send people out into the local communities, uh, walking dogs to the Humane Society, park reclamations, neighborhood cleanups. Kids would come back after a Saturday. They look at their account. They'd be like, 100,000 100, knowledge nuggets. They're like, whoa, a light bulb would go off. I could play video games for a month and not get that. So we started sending people out into the communities. And in one year of that program, 10.5 billion knowledge nuggets of volunteer hours. It was amazing. There was that moment where I was like, OK, I think we're onto something pretty cool here. The groundswell of gamified good. But this is the game changer for me. This is where the, everything started shifting. We started getting letters from parents and teachers and child psychologists saying, you know, my kid is in a wheelchair, but now he can fly. Like, my child has autism, but now he can speak. He can, cre he can speak through these, these, this hero that you've given him. And I was like, no, he gave himself that hero. The, the beautiful part about it was just all these kind of benefits that came from it that we had no idea. We're not even thinking about it until it started happening. And at that moment in time, I'm like, how lucky am I to have found purpose? I just felt so grateful. I have really talented friends that are still kind of trying to figure that out. So after 1.5 million subscribers, 
Fox makes an offer to acquire us. I'm like, no, we're just getting started. Everyone else is like, you no longer have 51% of this company, man. We're taking the money. I was like, whoa, okay. Like, you survived .com, call it a success. So I went back to Montana to try to figure out what was next. I sat there for a couple months in a pretty deep depression. And Fox acquired Super Dudes, rolled it into MySpace, kind of like looked under the hood, grabbed some games, shelved it. And that was it. It was kind of the end of that. And one day I had this realization that Fox bought a brand and not the purpose. And the purpose was still to go find and connect real life superheroes. So that was the pivot. It was something that we now call Hatch. And Hatch essentially is empowering real life heroes, bringing them together, people that are already making huge impact in the world, educators and scientists, and those that I mentioned. When you bring these people together, you can do incredible work. So Hatch is now 14 years in. It's a global network, three annual summits, curated being the very key part of that. It's like a chemistry set. Or like I obsess over like the percentage of who's in the room and how they're going to cr create collaborations together because ultimately the collaborations are the currency of Hatch. There's year-round peer-to-peer acceleration where the math is kind of funny. One plus one equals 11. It's an exponential um, acceleration of people in the, in the Hatch Labs, which are solution-driven think tanks. And in the last year, we've done Hatch Labs with, here's an example of all of these people you've probably seen at Biff here, um, all part of the Hatch Network. Mr. Saul Kaplan, curating an amazing group of people. And the, it's about cross-pollination, something else that, that Hatch and Biff really share. Cross-pollination of minds, cross-pollination of disciplines, industries, generations, and perspectives. And that's how problems get solved. And in the last 18 months, we've been working on, uh, with partnerships, a lot of these global, I mean, there's no shortage of things that we need to fix in this world, right? It's like the world is in pain right now. There's a lot of pain points to heal. So through design thinking labs, we'll go into the large organizations. These are four of them that we've worked with in the last uh, 18 months. And to work towards solutions to hatch a better world. But what is it, what is it a network for if we can't actually activate it and make change. And so, we, you know, connecting communities of purpose to catalyze critical change. This is, this is, as every year goes by, I think the urgency gets further and further dialed up. Like I like to say that, I don't like to say, unfortunately, it's just something that has been said over the last year, we're in this race between consciousness and catastrophe. And it's, it's a bit of an all hands on deck moment. That's all of us in this room. So after 14 years of Hatchers, not necessarily like every year of, of class of Hatch would like really collect and connect together. Like you guys are here during the breaks. But what happens with all the other years? There's a lot of human capital that can be cross-pollinating, right? So we stepped outside and started thinking about all the challenges that we're facing within a community of Hatch and realized that there's a lot of communities that need the same sort of functionality. So we started this tech company separately called H360, and H stands for humanity. So this is an example of being able to see how networks interact. Hatch, Biff, Sustainable Brands, Harvard Alumni, C2, CEO Connection. Imagine being able to access those people if you're looking for someone who is a climate change scientist, who knows PHP, whose favorite band is Tame Impala. Imagine being able to customize those searches. Imagine someone like, I need people that are experts in food systems. I need people that are experts in building networks and innovation, like Saul Coplin. So Saul's part of multiple networks. Biff, Hatch, Accenture, University of Rhode Island alumni. Every single one of those is like a portal into a bunch of opportunity that's sitting dormant currently. But imagine if you had AI and machine learning that could tell you that when you're traveling to London, there's X amount of people in your network, there's X amount of people who've already made recommendations for you, there's crash pad listings, there's invitations for dinner. Everywhere you go, there's a welcome mat rolled out. Remember how Yelp used to be relevant? <laughs> you're, sitting in a, you're sitting in a restaurant and you're like, who wrote this review? This is terrible. But imagine if you could like curate who's writing the reviews for you. Like, I'm going to Barcelona, I've never been there. Well, these are the seven things you gotta do according to the person that I trust. Curate buzz, you know exactly which frequencies you're looking for. Search for, and then 
And then instead of like people you should know because I went to high school with them, no. People you should know because you have the following 27 attributes in common and we're following how your mind works. We want you to connect with these people. Saul and I do this every single day. It's like old school operator switchboard. It's like, oh, you need to know, oh, you need to know, oh, you need to know. We just want to democratize the dashboard to us and multiple communities on top of that. So this uh, is a beta, the ask offer. I need a, I have a, connect together, becomes a project. There's project management tools around that. We launch this beta next week at Hatch. It's not two weeks, by the way, it's one week. So to wrap up, this question's been thrown around a lot. I was asked this question my third year of Hatch. What are the metrics of Hatch? And I was like, I was like, excuse me, what are the metrics of Hatch? Well, let me count how many people are coming to Hatch. Let's, um, let's, 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 hold on a second. What are the metrics of the impact of a Da Vinci or a Tesla or Steve Jobs or Madame Curie? What are the metrics of one person that can change the lives of 100 million? Hmm, pretty good metrics, right? So we could spend 30 years of our lives, and if we're mentoring one person that impacts the lives of 100 million, it's not a, not a bad job, right? Job well done. But the metrics are one, one. One plus one equals 11. It's one that can spread out and impact 100 million, and it's many of you that come together as one. So it's like an inverse formula in my mind. So I'm going to read this because this is about you. One line grows into art. One brick building, one brick becomes a building. One flame can ignite a blaze. One tree can birth a forest. One candle illuminates darkness. One star can guide a ship at sea. One door open can determine destiny. One kind word can transform a life path. One note can build a symphony. One song can spark a movement. One step can begin a journey. One voice alter history. One idea can save lives. And it begins with creativity and the inspiration of one, because the inspiration of one impacts the lives of millions. So who's next? You. So the challenge, everything you've heard so far today and the 10 more amazing speakers that are coming, tap into your superpower because in order to hatch a better world, we have to hatch better communities. And in order to hatch better communities, we must hatch our best selves. Thank you.